So um, thank you. So the my talk will be about um, a particular um, modality, which is uh, involved by. So basically, the idea is to be capable to image um, objects and biological samples, for instance, with an optical fiber. And this is a joint work with. Uh, uh, actually, this is the main work of my PhD student Olivier Leblanc on the left, and a joint work with Matthias Hofer. Uh, Hervé Rignot, both at uh, Institut Fresnel in Marseille in, in uh, France, and also Siddharth Sivankuti, formerly in that lab, and now uh, working in a uh, uh, physical lab in France. So imagine that you'd like to, uh, to see the neurons firing inside the brain. Uh, what are the modalities that are available nowadays to, to, to see that? Actually, they're, they're, they doesn't exist. They do not exist, sorry, um, because if you have a look to this uh, to this graphic, which is a gathering of information that were given in that reference at the bottom, you can um, just cluster the different techniques that are available. So on the left, you have uh, some modalities related to fluorescence imaging. You can cluster them by um, uh, the, the the resolution you can actually image with those modalities and the depth inside the brain or inside the biological sample you can reach with those modalities. And so nowadays it's kind of difficult to reach uh, the red point you have on the right, where you could have the possibility to image things that are deeply inside the brain and at the same time to have a very good resolution at the the, the cell size of what happens and possibly to see the, the neurons firing. And so the, the point of lensless endoscopy, ideally in a near future, I'm not going to show you any result of uh, neurons firing, is that uh, with that modality I'm going to present to you, potentially you could reach that, uh, that spot on the bottom right. So what is lensless endoscopy? So the, the, the very first design of it, uh, was created by the team of Hervé Rignot. And the idea in, in that modality is that you use an optical fiber, which is represented on, on the left. Um, and in this optical fiber, may I have a, a mic? Thank you, I will be a little bit more free. Um, so here in this modality, you have an optical fiber. And in this optical fiber, there is about 100 subfibers that you are going to use to to propagate lights um, and to generate a certain uh, illumination pattern on the biological sample here because you can encode the wavefront at the input of the optical fiber and so initially what what they did is to focus the beam here on the biological sample and to recollect the light reflected or re-emitted by the, the sample to recollect it back through the fiber and to measure the intensity of the, of the light that was recollected by the fiber into a single photodetector. And so the idea was to basically to, um, to, so to focus the beam according to this pattern and to follow a raster scanning technique where you sequentially visit all the possible points in a grid over the biological sample. And since you collect the intensity for each of the points, basically at the end, you collect a certain number of measurements that are very close directly to the image you'd like to obtain from the biological sample, simply because it's a raster scanning imaging. So um, in this context, um, it happens that, of course, you already have a nice um, um, the convolution problem was potentially to solve because this pattern here is not perfect. It's very narrow at the centrum, but you have some side loops and they designed a certain number of, uh, of arrangements of the, the, the sub course you have inside the optical fiber. Um, and for instance, it was a really bad idea to have a regular network in this arrangement because if you do follow such an arrangement, you have a, a lot of um, uh, periodicities in the spots. So what they obtained uh, eventually is to set up an arrangement that follow um, a non-periodic pattern. Actually, they, they sampled what they call a, a Fermat spiral, a golden spir Fermat spiral. 
so that they, they break any periodicity to obtain this very narrow focus beam. So um, here in, in our work, in the work of uh, Olivier Leblanc, we uh, prefer to uh, just reanalyze the, the, the context, the, 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 the applied, the mathematical model, sorry, describing the illumination pattern we get on the right. And to do so, uh, we are going simply to uh, collect all the locations of the cores. So the, the cores are just the, the, the location of the subfibers inside the optical fiber. You collect that into a set of positions, QJ. And uh, what you have before the optical fiber there is the possibility to program the, uh, the light, the, the, the complex amplitude of the light entering into each of those subfibers. And so uh, by programming that in a certain way, I'm going to explain that later, you can generate different patterns here that look like speckle patterns. And actually, um, this, uh, this study is very close to speckle imaging, which is uh, a field in itself in a certain literature. And uh, so you, you, you generate that, that kind of speckle pattern. And for other configuration of the, of the amplitude alphas there, you can generate the same uh, focused pattern that was used by Hervé Rignot. And uh, at the end of the day, what you have is simply a function here, phi of alpha in the intensity plane here, which, is, which depends on the vector alpha that I'm going to call the sketching vector. And the, 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 the good modeling of this pattern phi of alpha here is the key to really understand the imaging process. Because since at the end, you are going to collect back all the light into a single photodetector, the light that has been re-emitted or reflected depending on the modality. For instance, in fluorescence, it will be re-emitted. If it is just uh, uh, in a transmission mode, it will be just um, uh, reflected uh, or um, no, attenuated, sorry. Um, but the, the, the sensing model in the end is simply a kind of correlation between your function of interest here and the illumination pattern, depending on alpha. So it's a, a correlation a scalar product, a projection between F and phi of alpha. So it's very interesting to have a good model for phi alpha here. And the model, you can obtain it according to a standard um, far field approximation, because under this approximation, if you assume that the depth between the, the end of the peak optical fiber and the sample plane is sufficiently large with respect to the, the diameter of the fiber and the wavelength, you can uh, develop uh, the, the, the wave propagation model and see that phi of alpha here in, is in the amplitude, not in the intensity, is given by, um, sorry, in the intensity, not in amplitude, is given by this double sum of the weights alpha j and alpha k that are the uh, complex amplitude of all the cores with a very special function here that will be very important to the rest, for the rest of the moon. You see all the pairwise differences you have. This uh, drawing. Even let's see now what will be the impact of this model inside the scalar product of F with phi alpha, which is precisely the sensing model. So if you do so, what happens is simply by distributing this double sum uh, through the scalar product, because of course it's, uh, it's linear. What you see is that the former integration in blue here is going to project F onto those imaginary exponentials that is on, in the, the Fourier domain of the function f, but sampled on a certain number of frequencies that are related to the pairwise differences between the location of the course. And in front of that, you have those weighting factors, which are just related to the complex amplitude of the sub course, of the course, sorry. And so if you compactly rewrite this model, uh, according to this matrix that we call the interferometric matrix. And this matrix is simply such that the JK entry is the Fourier transform of F times a certain vignetting, 
function which is always there because it's due to the field of view of the device. It happens that what you do in the end in this sensing model on the left here is to uh, operate, um, as uh, Remy, Remy explained this morning, um, a sandwiching somehow of this matrix here with the two, with the same sketching vector on the left and on the right of this matrix. So in, in the end, this is nothing but a rank one projection, as Remy explained, of this interferometric matrix according to something that you can program thanks to the SLM in front of the optical fiber. And so the, the point is that this uh, part up to the imaginary number here, this part is really the frequency that you are going to, um, to obtain about your object of interest up to a multiplication by a window, which is the field of view. And so the, the, the point is that you, you like to have a sampling, if your, if your system is well designed, you like to have a good sampling of the frequency domain here. And this sampling is nothing but the difference you can create, any pairwise differences you can create up to a rescaling here uh, between the, the location of the course of your optical fiber. And so quickly, we can make three observations on this model. The first one is that it will be a good idea to have a sampling here, which is directly very dense in the Fourier domain. And in particular, since you can have not more than Q square entries here, you'd like ideally to have a Q square of the order of Q square different point in the, in the frequency domain, because it means that each entry of the interfer interferometric matrix will be different from the others. And it means that you will capture more and more uh, variety and information about your object of interest. Um, and conversely to the situation where you will have, for instance, um, many uh, frequencies with a high multiplicity because they will be present many times in your matrix. And in the end, you will have uh, uh, the variety of your sensing will be a kind of flow and it will be different, uh, difficult, sorry, to inverse the, the, the Fourier transform. So that's why we are lucky here because precisely the, the Fermat spir spiral configuration of the course that, were, that was already studied by Everino and his team um, precisely give us um, um, a different set here. So the, the different sets uh, consisting of all the pairwise differences, which is already very good in the sense that it is kind of dense in the Fourier domain and it reached almost this limit, which is represented there. A second observation is that we can have a look to this interferometric matrix and see the link that could potentially exist between the low complexity of F and the low complexity of this matrix. In particular, it's kind, of, it's kind of easy to show, but I'm not going to develop that here, that if F is made of a, uh, a few direct uh, distribution in the plane, what will happen is that this integration here will be turned into a, a summation over all those directs. And in the end, you will, you will see that this matrix here will be made of rank one uh, matrices. And so if the object is K sparse, meaning that it is made of K directs in the spatial domain, you can show that the interferometric matrix will be actually K of rank K. And so that there is a, a transport, a, a, a translation of the low complexity model you can have on F on the one you can have on I. The third of the observation is that this system is very close to another system that, which is well known in the literature, so the, the, the acquisition related to radio astronomy. And uh, for instance, Yves Vuillot, who was there uh, still yesterday, was, uh, uh, is, is really a specialist of that topic. And in particular, in radio astronomy, what you can show is that if you have an array of dishes here, of radio telescope, the, the course we have in the optical fiber, they are basically equivalent to the dishes you have in your array. So it's related to, um, to array, uh, to, how to say, um, array acquisition with antennas, antenna array, sorry, um, where basically the, the, the pairwise differences you have between two dishes is related to what is called the, the visibility, which is accessible in the spectral domain in the context of radio astronomy. And that's why from now on, I'm going to call 
this set here, the visibility set by analogy with this, this model. So now that I have described all that, I can formulate the, the final sensing model, uh, which is useful in our case, in the same way that Sandrine um, introduced the sensing model that was useful for uh, exoplanet and this detection. So in our case, what we have is that uh, if we collect a certain number of observations for many different uh, sketching vector alpha, maybe M such configurations, at the end, you collect a certain number of measurements that can be compactly rewritten like this with an operator A, which is nothing but the rank one operator introduced by Remy this morning, where you observed um, N rank one projection of the interferometric matrix here, according to this description of the rank one uh, operator, which is here. So that a comparison between uh, any metrics at the input here and rank one matrices formed by the, the sketching vector, which is there in the front. So this is a model which is well known that has been introduced by at least two teams, the one of uh, Tony Kai in 2015 and the team of uh, uh, um, Andrea Goldsmith with uh, that paper by Chen in, uh, in, at the same year. So basically the model does combines uh, two sensing modalities. First, the spectral sensing through the interferometric matrix and then the rank one projections. And this is the thing we are going to, to try to invert thanks to an optimization problem in a certain uh, way, and I'm going to describe that. But the two key questions we are going to address now is first to understand if the RUP operator captures enough information about the interferometric matrix in order to possibly recover it, if you at least follow a two-step reconstruction strategy. But in itself, it is important to know if the interferometric matrix captures enough information about uh, the function f itself. So if you have enough uh, frequencies that are visible through uh, your pattern associated with the creation of this, of this matrix. And so we give a few answers to, to these two questions and are related to a certain number of uh, assumptions and simplifications, at least for the, the, the simulations. But uh, at the end of the, the presentation, I will show you some experimental results obtained on an optical table. So not yet the, the lensless on the scope uh, I told you at the beginning. And uh, I'm going now to describe those assumptions. So the, the first two assumptions are very classical. Um, the idea is simply that we are going to assume that the, the field of view of the, the acquisition related to this vignetting function is inside a box of uh, width equal to capital L, and that the function of interest F is by assumption bound limited. And thanks to these two assumptions, I can uh, commonly just um, describe my sensing model in a discrete way rather than with these integrals uh, describing the Fourier transform. And so uh, potentially I will be able to use the, the DFT, for instance, instead of the, the, the Fourier integrations. The two other um, assumptions are first that I'm going to assume that F is kind of restrictive, but I, I need to assume that F is sparse in the canonical basis. I just used to, to do the this discretization. And we'll see later that we can extend that at least numerically. And that uh, fourth, that the, the number of visibilities is very close to Q square. And I don't have, um, so all the multiplicities I have outside of the DC component are equal to one for all the, the points I have in my frequency domain. And finally, I need to rely on former results, uh, for instance, used in radio astronomy, but also in partial uh, Fourier sampling in compressive sensing theory, uh, telling us that uh, for certain configuration of those frequencies, actually the sensing matrix phi which is related to that sampling of the Fourier domain, respects a standard property, um, property sorry, of a compressive sensing, which is called the restricted isometry property. I have seen that uh, property explained in a few posters here. Uh, and that, that property tells us that if um, 
the, the cardinality of the visibilities here, which is related to Q square, is sufficiently big compared to the sparsity level of my function, then the function phi here, sorry, the, the matrix phi will behave like an isometry up to a little distortion delta, which is there to, um, to also, if you want to have delta smaller, you will need to increase the cardinality of uh, V0. And finally, the sketching vectors, they are going to be generated randomly, but in a very particular way, we are only going to play with the face of those sketching vectors because they are complex. We are not going to play with the amplitude. We, are, we assume that the amplitudes are units. It's only the phase that are going to be uniform over the circle. So given those assumptions, I can, as I announced before, now describe the interferometric matrix according to a discrete model. So for any off-diagonal element of the interferometric, interferometric matrix, um, I will have the fact that I can explain this matrix with a discretization, de discretization of F um, I introduced in the uh, second, after the two first assumptions in the previous slide. And um, now I need also to further stabilize the rope operator because if I'm not going to do so, I will have difficulties to, to reconstruct my images. And the stabilization is kind of similar to what Remy explained this morning, except that rather than to make the difference between the, the odd and the even parts of the components of the rope operator, I prefer here to use another one, which is um, interesting for our, our application because we just need to subtract the mean of all the previous vectors. And so rather than to play with the uh, rope operator, the initial rope operator, we simply play with a rope operator where we don't have a rank one projection, but rather a projection on this matrix here. And this operator is actually easy to achieve or to reach because we can show that provided that you post-process the, the observation YK by subtracting their own mean, the result you get I see there is just equivalent to have observed your object of interest with that uh, debiased or centered operator. So it is not that you have to re-obtain the measurement, it is there directly by this post-processing. So in this context, we can first analyze theoretically what are the guarantees we can, we can set on, the, uh, on this reconstruction um, program here. And this reconstruction pro program is going simply, similarly to basis pursuit uh, denoise for those who knows it, um, to promote the sparsity of the signal of interest, V, of a, uh, a particular candidate, sorry, subject to a fidelity constraint between your observations and the re-observation of this candidate. So among all the candidates that are respecting this fidelity constraint, and I can, um, after the presentation, explain why it's the L1 norm here, um, you find the estimate which minimizes the L1 norm as a good proxy to the sparsity as usual. And so the, the first thing we had to develop in order to, to say something about the, the, the estimate which is produced by this program was to show that this operator B respects a variant of the restricted isometry property, variant in the sense that it is the L1 norm here which is involved in, in this property, which actually is related to the L1 norm we have to impose in the fidelity term there. And provided that M is big enough compared to the sparsity level of the function K, um, then you can show that with high probability, you are going to respect this property, high probability with respect to the generation, the random generation of the sketching vectors. And thanks to that, you can reach what is called instance optimality, which in a nutshell just tells you that the, the estimate you produce is both stable with respect to the noise you inject, that is injected, it's not that you inject it, but that is injected in the sensing model, and with respect to any deviation to the sparsity model, because the MSC, if you want, you have here between the true F and the estimate will be bounded by two terms, one which is zero if the function f is exactly k sparse and non-zero if it is not. So this thing is supposed to decay uh, quite nicely. And another term which is proportional to the level of noise. So 
so I need to hurry up. Uh, we did a certain number of simulations with that. Um, and in particular, in a very specific context, uh, simplified context with 1D uh, configurations uh, by varying um, in a Monte Carlo way, um, the sparsity level of uh, a bunch of uh, sparse vectors for different co-arrangements and different uh, number of measurements of your ROP operator. We were capable to reach those transition diagrams showing that what we, we obtain theoretically is actually observed in those um, uh, transition diagram. Since here you see that you need to have M higher than something which is roughly proportional to K to have a probability of success because this is the sense of this uh, uh, transition diagram. Each cell counts the number of times you, 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 you were capable to reconstruct your, your signals. Um, and you see here that those trends, it's not perfect, but they, they roughly uh, go like what was predicted by the, the condition to respect the, the real property. So uh, I'm close to finish, so still here, I'd like to show you uh, experimental results obtained in the lab of um, Hervé Rignot in the Institut Fresnel. So the idea was uh, to uh, mimic what we could obtain with the um, speckle imaging system. So the MCF is here in this diagram. You program the SLM according to certain pattern here to be sure that you, you will have those sketching vectors that are available to do your sensing. And then the object of interest is here represented in green. And uh, as a deviation to the model I considered at the beginning, we are going to consider here a transmission system. So we are not going to send back the light through the MCF. And we collect the light in a, a CMOS camera. And the single pixel assumption from the beginning is mimicked here simply by summing the, the pixels. The reason why we place a CMOS camera here is to have a point of comparison with the, the image which is actually observed and be capable to validate and to see if the system behaves uh, as we wish. So of course, it's, it was not so easy. So we had to, to do a certain number of calibrations in our system. And um, in particular, we had to follow previous, previous procedures that uh, Hervé um, and his team developed. So to calibrate the MCF and to know the correspondence between the input and the output. We had also to calibrate the speckle uh, in order to be capable to reproduce it from the alphas. And finally, the reconstruction method we, we used was not the, the former one because we wanted to have uh, experimental results. So we, we, we used a certain number of, uh, uh, of images for which the TV prior, the total variation prior is a good one. So you pref we prefer to use this reconstruction. And to show you the results, so here you have the ground truth that we know thanks to the CMOS camera. Um, and here, that will be the result obtained with the standard raster scanning imaging I presented at the beginning. Here, this is the result we will get with only 49 measurements, uh, which already provides a, a decent op, um, uh, observation of the ground truth, but with a number of measurements which is really low compared to the total number of pixels. And if you increase, of course, the number of measurements to a high number, which is anyway still 25% of the total number of, the, of pixels, you see that the quality is increasing. So it, there are some pros and cons with, between the raster scanning mode and those images, but you see at least that here, the edges are sharper. And if you analyze um, the evolution of the SNR when M increases for two uh, possible configuration, of course, um, you see that you have different accessible SNR according to uh, the number of cores. Okay, to conclude, um, the takeaway message is that you can use speckle imaging and a better knowledge of the model which is behind the speckle formulation, form, formation, sorry, to um, reconstruct uh, images by uh, illumination with those speckles because you you can develop the model into a factorization between the ROP and the interferometric model. Globally, there still remain a certain number of open questions. Uh, a few of them are to be capable theoretically to use more advanced sparsity models and not only the sparsity. Um, 
and maybe other more exotic models. Uh, it could be interesting to optimize the core arrangement to extend this analysis to 3D imaging because possibly we can analyze the speckle formation also in the depth. And the, the fact that it is random allows us to maybe focus the, the, the beam in different, and uh, not to focus, but to use the, the information of the, of the speckle uh, in the 3D volume in order to uh, have an extension of the scalar product I mentioned before. And finally, the calibration itself is a subject of interest that is often forgotten in, in many studies. And so the, the possibility to use data to obtain a better calibration and to uh, improve the quality of the reconstruction is also something we'd like to do in the future. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And, uh, sorry, I'm a bit out of time. Very interesting talk. Uh, a very quick question, if there is any. Um, hi, thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, so you motivated the, the the whole development basically by saying that you want to basically look very deep into the tissue. Yes. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, you have basically presented a, a two-dimensional kind of version. You mentioned that there's a 3D kind of uh, extension possible yes uh, but that i think would require that the tissue is more or less uh transparent and not much scattering yes uh and it's not uh, at least not in the brain yes so uh i mean basically the diffusion will will basically limit a lot what you can see so uh how do you imagine to get to this point that you yeah uh, that... motivated sorry um, you are totally right. So first, a clarification. By depth, I, I meant the, the accessibility, uh, the depth of the point you want to reach. Um, and uh, so it's, the idea here is that the, the optical fiber is, um, is uh, reduce the invasivity of uh, this modality. For instance, you can introduce it in, inside the brain, potentially, by digging a little hole uh, or through the nose or something. Um, and then once you are somewhere where the practitioner told you, oh, this is very important to have a look to the neurons there, then of course you, for instance, in the, in the 3D um, extension that maybe exists, you will be able to study a very small that tip. And um, so it's not that you are going to cover the full depth of the brain. So you want to have a very high resolution, which is local and be capable to be local anywhere you are capable to place the optical fiber. Uh, but you are totally right. It's a very difficult program. For instance, uh, uh, it's related to optical uh, tomography as explained by, by uh, Luke Beck previously. And you have a lot of nonlinearities. The, the, the measurement depends on the signal in a nonlinear way. And so it will be very tough to, to solve. But anyway, uh, with classical assumptions, you, you, can, uh, you can hope to have uh, uh, a good reconstruction of very spiky events uh, with not without too much um, interferences between the the object itself and the and the light. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then, but then the main challenge will become actually the calibration of the fiber because, like, if you are moving the fiber, basically you change all the okay. your coefficient yes. matrix alpha. Yeah. Uh, so the, the point is that they manufacture the fiber in a in a clever way, so it's, it's never perfect, but it is better than what it could be because they twist all the, the fibers inside the, the, the main fiber. And so that's because of this twist, if you bend the fiber a little bit, the path of all the fibers will remain roughly the same and you won't modify, for instance, optical path between different fibers. There will be a bit of change, but less than, than if all the fibers were just parallel inside the, the big one, because if you do a bending, then you will have a longer path for the, because of the curvature for certain. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sure that there might be uh, some uh, other questions, including myself, I have some other questions, but for just keeping to the schedule, I suggest to just keep it for the end of the session. Thank you again for this very interesting talk. Thank you.